Were you ever complaining about John McCain's vote record? The only reason why you're doing it now is because we're running for the same position and someone has convinced you that attacking me is going to help you. Marco Rubio slices and dices Jeb Bush at the GOP debate. Where do their campaigns go from here? A strong Sun Sentinel editorial calls for Rubio to resign for missing so many Senate votes. The editor of the Sun Sentinel joins us on the roundtable to talk about it. And showdown on Miami Beach. Who will be the city's next mayor, challenger David Weider or incumbent Philip Levine? We've got your debate right here. Good morning. So glad you could join us on this beautiful Sunday. Glenna is still away. We will get to the fallout from this week's GOP presidential debate. But first, a new debate between the candidates for mayor of Miami Beach. Voters have two choices on Tuesday. Incumbent Mayor Philip Levine on the left there. He was first elected two years ago. He and or they can choose attorney and historic preservation activist David Weider, who says Levine has acted unethically. I got them together earlier to debate. And we are pleased now to be joined by the two candidates for Miami Beach mayor. First, the incumbent, Philip Levine. Mr. Levine was elected in 2013. He's a businessman who now devotes basically all of his time to the duties of being mayor. David Weider is a native of Miami Beach. He is a lawyer, practiced law there for 43 years. He served for six years as chairman of the Miami Beach Historic Preservation Board. To both of you, good morning. Great to have you come in. Great to be here, Good Michael. morning. Thank All right, you. Let's begin with the most basic question, Mayor Levine. Why are you the best man for the job? Why should voters re-elect you to another term? Well, Michael, we've done a lot together in the last two years. I mean, the community really came together. And we have a long way to go. We'll be breaking ground on our renovation of our convention center uh, in December. Uh, we've made some major strides to stop flooding. We have a whole plan in place. We need to follow through with that plan. North Beach is coming alive with some incredible incentives of things we've actually done. And, of course, our police department. The culture has started to change with an entire new command yeah. uh, department. Well, so you brought in Dan Oates to be the police sure chief. Sure did. Sure did. And we're just getting going. So two years is a short period of time. We need to finish the job that we started. All right. David Weider, uh, you are a uh, longtime citizen of the beach. You spent six years uh, chairing the Historic Preservation Board. Now you want to be mayor. Why are you running? Well, I want to restore integrity, trust, and responsiveness to City Hall. Um, I've read about uh, a lot of the uh, uh, improprieties that have, that have come across uh, with the mayor's uh, PAC, Relentless for Progress, and I felt that it was time for a change. Uh, I want people to not have to pay to play to be participants in the governmental process and to be able to uh, exercise their rights freely and get a, get, get a fair shake in City Hall. All right, well, uh, let me point out just factually that Relentless for Progress is, was a political action committee chaired by Miami Beach Commissioner Jonah Wolfson. Now, the mayor had an association with it, but it wasn't really his pack, I don't think, or was it? Well, as I understand it, the mayor participated in phone calls to solicit uh, contributions to people who were doing business with the city of Miami Beach. Uh, builders, contractors, developers. Even and though there is an ordinance that prohibits that very there thing. There is an ordinance that prohibits it directly or indirectly. Mm -hmm. um, there was a, there was a, uh, the mayor, I think, takes the position that the city attorney gave him the, uh, the green light to do it and that it was legal. But whether it was ethical or not um, is another question because uh, the, may the ordinance says directly or indirectly. Right. Well, Mayor Levine, you were on this program sure. a number of weeks ago. You talked about it then. Talk about it again. Well, what, what was your relationship with Commissioner Wolfson and Relentless right. for Progress? Well, thank you for the opportunity, Michael. First of all, Commissioner Wolfson began a PAC. He asked me to fundraise a little bit for the PAC. I was happy to do so. After checking with our city attorney, who made it very clear, it's 100% legal. Now, we know that. And, of course, the Ethics Board said the same thing. It is legal. But more importantly than that, you know, I listened to the people in Miami Beach. I think Commissioner Wilson did. We realized that although there's PACs everywhere, Michael, there are the, uh, Marco Rubio has one, the county mayor has one, there are the, everyone has a PAC. But Miami Beach can do better, and we listen to the people of Miami Beach, and I am happy that Commissioner Wolfson closed the pack. As you know, I don't take a salary. I don't take expenses. I self-fund my entire campaign last time. Right. I'm self-funding it this time. But you know what? When I look back at it, I say to myself, yeah, it was legal. But you know what? Truthfully, Michael, it was boneheaded. 
I shouldn't even have been involved with it, but that's okay. You live and you learn. We've done a lot of great things in Miami Beach, and sometimes, you know, there's a couple of things that you look back and you say, hey, even though it's legal, yeah. it's not for us. All right, well, let me ask you about something else that you have done since you raised the sure. topic of your, the fact that you don't take a salary. It's not a big salary. You yeah. don't take any, and you self-fund your campaign, but I am told that you have added a number of positions to the mayor's staff, including a chauffeur, an aide yeah. who drives you around, and a brand manager. I mean, yeah. are there people who are working for the mayor now, who yeah. uh, positions that didn't exist before? You know what's amazing about politics, Michael? You see it all the time. It's incredible. In business, you're not allowed to lie. But in politics, for some reason, you're just allowed to lie. No right. one does so any fact-checking. So line? the answer is absolutely not. It's not the case. Matter of fact, we have one point two more people in our office than they had four or five years ago. 1.2. And I think actually now we have less than that. But remember something, we're doing so much more than the previous administration ever did. And more importantly, we communicate with the people. Email, Facebook, yeah. social media. I, and we're I get letting, your emails. Because yeah. we're doing so much, we want the people to know it. And we want them involved, and that's what we're doing. Yeah. But you know what's incredible, Michael, you know, for me, I have my own private driver when I need it. I pay for myself. When I fly around the world for our city, I pay for it myself. The fact of the matter is, is that our budget for our city commission and our office there has literally remained the same. And it's a shame to lie. Uh, David Weider, I think that you have raised this issue before. Is the mayor right? I mean, is the, uh, the staff uh, well, about the, the same as it was under Medi Bauer or previous mayors? Well, it's my understanding that in the, in the uh, city uh, budget, uh, which has incidentally gone from 280 to 300 million dollars since Mayor Levine took office. Um, there are uh, charges for a security company, which charges the city and the taxpayer ninety thousand dollars to take the mayor around. He has a constant flow of emails that go out uh, burnishing his image. I understand he has three or four publicists. Um, and uh, he city paid or paid by him? I think they're city paid. They're in the budget. And is that is that true, Mr. Once Mayor? Once again, Michael, it's wonderful to be able to lie, but it's not true. Okay, it's completely false and not true. But obviously, you know, Mr. Weeder thinks that the previous administration with Matty Bauer did a great job, and that's what they're all about. They're all about taking the city back to where it was. We're about taking the city forward and continuing what we began. Now, you know, it's incredible. When you have so many lies, you just have to just say, a lie is a lie, no matter which way you cut it. Well, let me, let me ask you both about this. Uh, the Miami Herald, October 22nd, uh, had a endorsement, they rather say recommendation, on the mayor's race. And uh, Mr. Weeder, they had many good things to say about you. And uh, Mayor Levine, in the end, they endorsed you, although I have to say, honestly, it was about as tepid an endorsement as I have seen. I want to put part of the endorsement, however, up on the screen so people at home can read this. The Herald said, if re-elected, Mr. Levine should make it a point to mature as a politician, to serve all of Miami Beach. We hope that these troubled times have been a learning experience for the mayor. We're willing to give him a second chance to prove he is not mayor ego. Boy, that's damning with faint praise. Well, I'll tell you, Michael, I'm so proud to have their endorsement, whichever way they want to give it. But, you know, the last time I ran for mayor, you remember something? They didn't endorse me. I we got no endorsements, but I wanted a landslide. And according to the right track, round track, Miami Beach feels we're going in the right direction. So I'm happy to have their endorsement. And by the way, we know we're going to have victory again because the people of Miami Beach, they want to continue the progress we began. So I'm not so sure the Miami Herald speaks for the people. Well, the Miami Herald speaks for itself, and I don't think they claim <laughs> to have exactly a, a mandate. I remember the first race in which they exactly. said we're not, we're not endorsing anybody. Mr. Weider, what they said essentially about you was, uh, He's been a good citizen, served on the historic preservation, uh, but uh, these are kind of rough and tumble times in the city, and you don't really have elected political experience. That's very true, uh, and I don't believe uh, Mayor Levine had elected political experience before he was uh, elected. I don't, I don't believe that uh, many politicians, including Abraham Lincoln, uh, had elected experience. And in fact, if you, Abraham Lincoln said that if you want to test a man's character, don't give him adversity give him power. And I think that Mayor mm -hmm. Levine has, uh, has uh, shown himself to be not worthy of uh, being elected a How second so? time. How so? What, what is, well, first of all, the, transgression, first, what, what is... First of all, the, the idea of the... I have a, a document here that shows that he has a $90,000... Uh, I have a document that shows he has a $90,000 driver that's uh, taken from the city uh, budget. And uh, 
there are a lot of other issues, including uh, the flooding uh, issues and the pumps issues. Uh, that, well, uh, hasn't that been to some degree a success? Yes, it has, but it, 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 is, it, it has been a success in his neighborhood only. And Mayor, Mayor Levine would say that uh, the reason it's a success in his neighborhood is because uh, the, that's topographically the lowest lying is that area the Sunset of the, Harbor of the, neighborhood. The Sunset uh, Harbor neighborhood. That's yeah. correct. All right. Well, hold on just a minute. Okay. Let me ask you about that. I know that you sure. and your business partners have sure. some investments, some property in that area, yeah. and I don't know that it got more or less attention from the city with pumps and uh, but it's a low right. lying area. Well, Michael, I'll tell you something. Two years ago, Alton Road, West Avenue, and Sunset Harbor were completely underwater. Right. In the last three weeks, we've had the highest tides in Miami Beach history. Those three areas are completely 100% dry. So I wish I could say that I own the entire western half of Miami <laughs> Beach, but I don't. But you know what happens? You know what this is about? And, I, and I'm sorry to say, this is the politics of personal attacks. This is the politics of hate. This is not the politics of getting things done and moving forward. And, and I'm always happy to listen to ideas and new plans. Bring them on. We'd love to hear it. Yeah. But, but personal attacks, people don't care. They don't listen. And by the way, they're all false. Well, I don't, uh, let's say, as a political reporter for a long time, I have heard a lot of personal attacks. What Mr. Weeder is saying, I think, is certainly critical, but I wouldn't call it per would I mean, I would is not, this personal? I would, no, it is not a personal attack. In fact, I like Mayor Levine as a person, but I just don't think he's running the city except to benefit himself and his friends. I mean, his, his personal... Uh, friend Scott Robbins owns property along Espanola Way. I understand that's the next place to be okay. elevated. And uh, if you want to discuss other issues like well, the Ocean Terrace up well, let's, I'll tell you we'll get what. to that too. We'll get to I'll the let you ocean, ask the questions, Michael. We'll get to the Ocean Terrace question uh, in just a minute. So stay with us. We'll be back with a discussion about who should be the mayor of Miami Beach. Welcome back this morning. We are talking to Miami Beach Mayor Philip Levine and his challenger, David Weeder. And uh, Mr. Weeder, let's talk a little bit about this uh, referendum question that's on the ballot Tuesday on Ocean Drive. It's a little complicated, but I think the gist of it is that a, a very wealthy a couple of developers want to take the North Beach area, and I think you grew up, you live in... You mean Ocean Terrace, Mike. Oh, Ocean Terrace, I'm sorry, not Ocean Drive. Ocean Terrace off 73rd Street and they want to get a floor area ratio variance which would essentially would it not allow a larger footprint of the building and high rises to be built there yes it would there would be a 250 foot tower put there and there would be I think a 125 foot hotel and uh, as you know this is a zone of historic uh, importance it's the it's a, it's on the national register and it's a local historic district mm -hmm. as well mm -hmm. uh, it would increase congestion it would increase uh, 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 density so my, my point is is that this is the first time since David Derma did the down zoning in 1997 that something like this has appeared on the ballot we don't want to have uh, increased congestion and another glass tower. The developer there could have uh, certainly um, developed the property in a uh, reasonable manner. That property could be developed without an increase in FAR. But the thing is that a lot of, a lot of the contributions that went to Relentless for Progress, we don't know where the money went. It, there, was a, there was a series of all kinds of... Uh, Some of the uh, accounting on their, on their reporting is a little uh, and, and cloudy. A lot of, and I, but look, let, let, me, let, me, let me ask the I just wanted to make that one point, Michael, yeah. that a lot of, we don't know what that money is, using, is being used to finance the uh, extensive advertising campaign to... Uh, convince the voters that this is in their best interest. All right. Well, Mayor Levine, uh, sure. you voted to put this on the ballot uh, for all the voters of Miami Beach. That's not necessarily your support for the right. question, but where do you stand on it? Michael, let me tell you what it is. First of all, North Beach is an area that's been underserved, underdeveloped. It's an area that's been dying for help. When I ran for mayor, I knocked on 6,000 doors. The people of North Beach said, help us. This is a tale of two cities, and we've done incredible things to help North Beach. A particular developer came in and said, I'd like to invest $100, 200000000 million in an area that is, needs help. 
Well, we felt, not just myself, five other commissioners voted 6-1 to put this on the ballot. Yeah. Let the people of Miami Beach make that decision. And that's not my decision to make. Matter of fact, I don't want to influence their decision. I want them to make that decision. But I know one thing. I know that for many years that area has done nothing. And people have said, please clean well, it up, please make it better. Mayor Levine, I, I have to say, uh, one of your political consultants, maybe your major political consultants, is a very sharp, shrewd guy named David Custon. And I don't know if you can compartmentalize this and say, okay, David, you're working with me on my mayoral campaign, and whatever you do on Ocean Terrace with the developers right. is your business, but there is a perception that because David Custon is somebody that you're close to, yeah. that because he is working with the developers on that ocean terrace, yeah. that there is some kind of inherent conflict of interest. Well, is there? Michael, I'll tell you something. I have multiple political consultants. That's one in particular that you're talking about, who, by the way, is representing many people on many campaigns around the city and the state of Florida. I'm just one. And I think if that was the case, you would have probably seen me come out at this point very aggressive in favor of ocean terrace. And what I have done is done nothing, and I've stayed back. You know. Think about something. Receiving contributions or, or, or making votes, you have to have a strong constitution. You have to know how to do the right thing. Either you do or you don't. And I think that I've proven in the last two years on all the development that I have stopped on Miami Beach, uh, which I can go through a list with you, all right. that I have the ability to say, say no to friends. And that's what I do all the time. All right. Well, let me ask you both about this. But, Mr. Mayor, let me begin with you. Uh, just last week, I was there as you and Jimmy Morales and... Yeah. Uh, your fellow commissioners unveiled the new design for the Miami Beach Convention Center, which is a huge economic engine, or should be, for the community. It's been sort of weak uh, in the last several years because it's not modern. Now, uh, $515 million to do that. Is that a good investment? It's a great investment. We've been a long time coming. Remember something, when I ran for mayor, I said the existing deal they have is a terrible deal. We were transferring those 55 something acres to a third party developer and we're putting in five or $600 million. I said, that's a bad deal. We canceled that deal. We're renovating it ourselves. And with that parking lot in front was gonna be a building. Now it's gonna be a six acre green space park. So we think we're on the right track. We need to be able to attract the right kind of people that stay at our hotels. Right. And that's what we're moving forward with. All right. Mr. Weeder, what about the design on the convention center of the money? Well, the, the, the current plan is $500 million. And I understand that we do need a, a renovation of the convention center. There's absolutely no question about it. But what I do question is a 30-story hotel, all that concrete, across the street from the beautiful uh, New World Center. I think it would detract to the, from the contextuality of the of the neighborhood. Just All right. So it, that's a excuse me. That's a March referendum question. Yes. Whether the city-owned land should be leased to John Portman, who wants to build this 800-room hotel. That's absolutely correct. It is on the ballot. Yeah. And do you support the uh, hotel? I mean, how can I you think have a successful convention center without an adjacent hotel? Michael, I know we need a hotel, and this is a hotel that will cost nothing for taxpayers and generate revenue and help us to build more public transportation. And to answer the New World Symphony question, the chair of the New World Symphony, they all want this hotel to happen, so it's a very positive thing for them. Yeah. But once again, it may need to be tweaked. It may need to be a little smaller. It may, we need to bring in the community to make sure. Yeah. But that's not until March, and once again, that's the people's decision. That's not all our right. decision. David Weeder, Philip Levine. Great to have you come in, and uh, we'll be there on Tuesday night to see what happens. Thanks, gentlemen. All right, stay with us. We'll be back with The Roundtable. You should be showing up to work. I mean, literally, the Senate, what is it, like a French work week? You get like three days where you have to show up? You can campaign or just resign and let someone else take the job. I don't remember you ever complaining about John McCain's vote record. The only reason why you're doing it now is because we're running for the same position and someone has convinced you that attacking me is going to help you. Good. Well, that was the exchange of the night between Marco Rubio and Jeb Bush, and we're going to talk it now about it now with our powerhouse roundtable, a time to analyze and opine on the week's news. We've got an all-star cast this morning, beginning with Rosemary O'Hara. She is the editorial page editor of the Sun Sentinel. Her editorial board caused a political earthquake this week when it called on Rubio to resign because she said they're not doing, he's not doing his day job. Carolyn Gunnis is executive editor of the Miami Times, which focuses on serving the African-American community. Her paper, I think, has done an outstanding job covering the Corey Jones story. 
And we are glad to welcome back Mark Caputo, the Florida correspondent for Politico and author of the Monday through Friday Political Florida Playbook, must reading for all things political in the Sunshine State. Welcome to all of you, ladies, gentlemen. Good to be here. Great to have you here. All right, so let's begin with the Wednesday night debate. Uh, I said on the air Wednesday night that I thought that it was Jeb Bush's best debate, but uh, that's not saying much, is it, Mark? No, that's a low bar. <laughs> Part of the problem that Jeb Bush had is not only was that exchange that he prompted there to Rubio whack him and kind of knock him into silence, but the yeah. fact that he was knocked into silence. Jeb Bush said the least in that debate uh, than any other candidate up on stage. Right, right. Five and minutes and, or six minutes or so. I, yeah, it varies on uh, exactly how you start and yeah. stop the stopwatch. But in the end, I did think that Jeb sounded okay when he spoke. He just didn't speak enough. And the one time he did speak in that exchange with Rubio, it certainly didn't play well. Right. And in fact, one point, uh, I have read, Rosemary, that his campaign manager was knocking on the uh, control room door saying, hey, give my guy more time. But if his guy wants more time, he's got to demand it. That's right. You, know, you have to insert. When there's 10 people on the stage, you've got to insert yourself. Right. And he just doesn't, didn't come across in a strong, forceful way. And, and and people really weren't saying it was his best debate. In fact, it was just the, that people were really disappointed and continue to be disappointed by his performance. Right. And Carolyn, at the uh, an event in New Hampshire the next day on the Thursday after the debate, Jeb Bush said, my campaign is not on life support. Mm -hmm. That doesn't sort of encourage you, does it? It almost sounds like he's admitting that it's on life support and please support me so <laughs> that I don't go away, but it's early. It's sort of early. Mark and I were talking about this early, earlier, and he thinks that um, there's, uh, you know, it's almost like too late for Jeb because the first votes are in January, et cetera. But mm. um, really, Jeb has sort of thought that the Bush name was going to be what was going to get him in the door, and I think he came at this all wrong. Well, he did say earlier before the debate, I think, Darn, there's so many cool things I could be doing. And the implication was if it just weren't for this irritating primary process and dealing with Donald Trump and editorial writers like right, you. Right. Yeah, no, he needs an attitude adjustment. You know, it's sort of get in the game. And I know he wants it. He had a plan laid out. He got his big donors, you know, and this big bankroll behind him, had his policies that he wanted to roll out. And, you know, people do want to hear it, but then it's like people more want to hear from people who are, who are not in the establishment. So he, he needs to show that he can be fast on his feet, pivot, and, and get in the game in a bigger way. Yeah. And I think to, to that point is that, yeah, he had a plan, but as Mike Tyson famously said, everyone's got a plan and then they get punched in the mouth. Mm -hmm. And that's what's happened yeah. to him over and over again. And not only has he looked like the ossified candidate who's unable to kind of move, but his premise is false that he initially ran on. I'm going to be the joyous candidate. You know Jeb Bush. I've talked to a lot of Jeb Bush's mm -hmm. longtime people as appointees. I say, describe Jeb Bush in one word. And they'll give me 10, 15, 5, 20. Yeah. None of them say joyous. And he's no. not showing himself to be joyous. And no. so he's in this positive feedback loop in a negative way or a vicious cycle or circle yeah. where his negatives are reinforcing themselves and they're helping Rubio. Right. Um, Let's get to one of my favorite things that happened this week, which was <laughs> a, an editorial written in the Sun Sentinel on Wednesday. Uh, wonderful timing, the day of the debate. And your editorial board, and I don't, I know that editorial writers don't claim that was mine, but boy, it certainly sounded like <laughs> Rosemary O'Hara. Anyway, it said essentially Marco Rubio is ripping off the voters of Florida by n missing all these Senate votes and if he can't show up for his day job he ought to resign. Exactly. Yeah, you know, we sent him there because he said he was going to make a difference and show that, you know, he that Republicans the the new style and he's he's missed more votes than anybody. 59. N not yes, and, and whereas compared to like Bernie Sanders, who is 74, has only missed 10. Yeah. So you know he misses the floor votes on the big issues of the day. He misses the committee meetings, and he misses the intelligence briefings. That's as much concerning to me that you know when we're dealing with ISIS and so much turmoil in the world that he sends his staff members to intelligence briefings. Right. Um, 
I, I thought that his answer, of course, he was extremely well prepared on yeah. Wednesday night, but uh, Mark Caputo, uh, his answer was done, I thought, politically, very cleverly, where he said, well, I read that editorial with amusement, and it's just more evidence of the bias shown by the American media, uh, especially the lamestream. He didn't say lamestream, but that's what he meant. Republican candidates seldom lose votes by bashing the mainstream news media. Uh, you know, kind of like, uh, was it Willie Sutton who said he robbed banks because that's where that's the money where is? That's where the money was, You yeah. bash the news media because that's where the votes are in the GOP primary. Right. Uh, Rosemary, I've got to say, uh, you weren't letting up. The foot was, uh, pedal was still to the metal on Friday. <laughs> Here is Friday's <laughs> Sun Sentinel, and it, I'll read the headline. Rather than resign, Rubio blames the media. And you go on to say Rubio dodged the concern expressed by our editorial board about his poor Senate record. Uh, neither did he address our call for him to resign. At no point has he ever really addressed the fact that he has missed so many votes. Right. No, he... Um he, he's a very disciplined politician. Yes, he he knew what it was he wanted to say, and he did not address the fact that he is MIA from his J-O-B. <laughs> and you know, the thing is that if he wants to run for president, do it. Go all out. You know, yeah. make it. But, but what we've learned is you can't do that and do this job too. There's still a year left on, over a year left on his term, and we deserve to have somebody in yeah. that seat. But he's not going to resign it because he needs the paycheck, because he, he, you know, the prestige and the platform, and he also, it gives him staff. I mean, I'm hearing from his, his Senate staff about campaign matters. Yeah, there does seem to be a lot of bleed over there, mm -hmm. and that is simply not allowed under uh, Senate rules and, in fact, uh, the Constitution. I mean, you don't campaign from your office, your elected office. Right. All right, everybody hold on. We're going to take a little break. Back with our roundtable in just a minute. Welcome back. Live in our studio this morning, our powerhouse roundtable, Carolyn Vernus from Miami Times, Rosemary O'Hara from the Sun Sentinel, Mark Caputo from Politico. And um, uh, Carolyn, I need to ask you, from your point of view and from the point of view of black voters, is there anybody out there that they like? Is it Hillary or are they excited about her? I think the people who need to say that they're supporting Hillary are saying they're supporting Hillary. But if you peel back the, the onion a couple of layers, you'll find that um, this, you know, the regular Joe, they're still not sure about Hillary. I mean, Hillary's coming across as somebody that has the resume, she has the experience, and we know that, but she still needs to connect with people. She still needs to come off as the everyday grandma. She is, yeah. you know, she's not really doing that, and I think a lot of the voters still want to feel like, hey, you know, I connect with you. We have something in common. And I'm not sure that she's doing that sales pitch very well. But do you think she has a good foundation in the black community to build up on? She can build on it, um, but she needs to be more vocal and she needs to be more visible. And I'm sure she's going to start doing the southern states and, and the blocks. I know she just recently launched her African Americans for Hillary for African Americans in Atlanta. And she aligned herself very well at Clark University. So. I think she is starting to realize that this is a part of part of the game. It's not well, just, it's you know, a critical here's part of the game. Yeah, uh, it's an essential. You know, the, in 2012, at least in Florida, African American voters overperformed. That is relative to their uh, percentage on the roll on the voter rolls. African American voters actually voted a higher rate. Mm -hmm. uh, were it not for that, more than likely Obama would have lost Florida or come far closer to right. losing. But will, they, won by less than will they perform for her is the issue. Correct. You have to go out and actually campaign and reach out and touch people and say, yeah. not only am I reaching out and touching you and, and saying you matter, but here, here I'm going to make you yeah. show, I'm going to show how yeah. you matter. And, and it's at the same time, it's interesting that the president says he's going to get involved. So unlike in the last time out, you know, when you had non pop, he was an unpopular president or in the, eight years ago. The, the outgoing guy wasn't so popular. Mm -hmm. This time he is going to be engaged, and so I well, think he will, you know, try to inspire the troops. Well, I think he could. 
Um, I know I mentioned to someone that, you know, uh, Hillary was in Atlanta. I said, are you going to go over there? And they go, only if she invites Obama. So she mm -hmm. needs to. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, mm -hmm. she needs to definitely align herself with yeah. him. All right, before we get off politics, and we're going to talk about the Corey Jones case here in a minute, but uh, I am compelled to ask you, Rosemary, uh, first about the CNBC debate, and I have done a couple yes. of dozen yes. TV debates, just yes. did one this morning yeah. earlier on the Miami Beach, uh, and I have to say that overall, and I don't want to be too critical of my friends in the media, not that I know any of those moderators, mm -hmm. I thought they were awful. Yeah, you know, I, I do not believe that they go into a room and try to come up with how are we going to ask gotcha questions. I do think, you know, moral authority, does he have the moral authority to be president over the top? But when the candidates also, but, the, but on the other hand, neither do, does a television audience want to listen to a candidate speak for four or five minutes, not be interrupted. There needs, they, they want to know that he's human. So maybe they, we did in the fan gate debate, yeah. we did this lightning round that gets at, you know, does right. he know how to use a supermarket scanner? But also <laughs> let's engage his people on the issues. But this, this. Well, this it, was not under control. I thought, say, Anderson Cooper and Jake Tapper on uh, CNN, and I thought Megyn Kelly and Blair, uh, Brett Blair uh, Bear on, uh, on Fox, I thought they were excellent. Well, I think uh, in the problem that you had here was that the moderators almost wanted to have interviews with the candidates on stage instead of moderating the debate. Yeah. It, uh, think of it like and kind then, of sailing, just lightly touch the tiller and steer the candidate. Well, and, that's uh, ideally what you should do. Um, uh, Carolyn, I have to say I've covered, as indeed the Miami Times has and all the other media, uh, this really tragic case of the death of Corey Jones, this young man who was coming back from a musical uh, engagement, a gig, and then gets shot on the side of the road. Uh, the funeral was yesterday. Uh, one of the most unsatisfactory things about this is that it's going to be maybe months, if not a year, before there are answers. Is the community going to be patient enough to wait? I hope it is. This is one of those cases where you you really can't stop. They really need to continue to to pound the pavement. They need to continue to ask questions. They need to continue to to talk to the state attorney's office because this one is just it just so senseless. It doesn't make any sense and there's right. so many unanswered questions. And there were so many things that this officer did uh, that appeared to violate standard police protocol. Yes, I mean we know that when they're out of uniform they can be uh, aggressive. Remember James Blake, the uh, tennis player? Yeah. Um, you know, he was tackled and, and pushed down by, a, you know, arrested by a plainclothes policeman right. who Mistaken. did not yeah. yeah, they mistaken his ID, but they did not identify themselves. So we right. know that we already have some evidence that they can be aggressive even well. if they, they're they not in uniform. And so, yeah. you know, poor Corey, who knows what he thought when he saw this well, fan perpendicular That's part of the tragedy of is that we mm -hmm. will never know right. what and he I, thought. And I think the other problem in is... In 10 seconds, Mark. We talked about this last time that the chances of there being a conviction are relatively low because there's no other witnesses. Right. right. What really needs to change on the front end going forward are police practices mm -hmm. in, in dealing with people. We need body cameras. We need And we're going to talk about that in the next week or two, body cameras, and inviting my friend John Rivera from the Miami-Dade County PBA who says last week I misrepresented his position. So, John, we're going to get you on. Oh, <laughs> all right. Thank you all for coming thank in. You. Good, good discussion. Thank you. After the break, a sweeping and rare look at Cuba. I'm going to sit down with two local 10 journalists who had unprecedented access on the island, who prepared a stunning series of reports. Starting tonight at 11 o'clock and for the entire month of November, you're going to be able to see Cuba as no American has seen it for half a century. We'll be presenting an extraordinary series of reports we call Historic Access, Cuba Coast to Coast. The stories will air at 6 and 11 on Local 10 News Monday through Friday. And the creative forces behind the series are the two people whom you see here. Producer, writer Michelle Lacamoire and reporter Hassel Vella. 
Thanks for coming in on Sunday, but this is so important. And I think the first question, Hansel, is since no American journalists have been really allowed free access to the island in maybe half a century, how did you get it? Well, you know, from our past, uh, we've been in Cuba since January covering the changes that have been happening on the island, and we really have developed a relationship uh, with the uh, with the government there and the people most importantly a working relationship a work, of course of yeah. course because they know our role is critical in telling the american people what is happening on the island and i have to say to be fair we've never been stopped or told or restricted in what we have done yeah uh, Michelle, I know that you still have, you are proudly Cuban-American, you still have some family members and that you and your mother uh, go at least once a year to visit family members. So uh, it's not as if you haven't been to Cuba, but you went to parts of Cuba you've never seen before. Yes, Michael, I, we visited places that I've only heard about growing up. So to actually go there and see it for myself and actually share that experience with my uncle because it's we, we show you and we explain to you that my uncle one of my uncles is our guide he's essentially the person who takes us across Cuba and he has enough knowledge plenty of knowledge about the country so to just experience that with him right well and you explained to me when you came back that you would drive in to drive through a province drive into a city and your uncle would begin giving you the history of the city I mean you were with an extremely knowledgeable person. What are we looking at here? Is this Varadero? That's Varadero. This right here is Cienfuegos. Uh, Benny's town, Benny More's town, was known uh, famous. For, uh, the town is made famous in one of his songs. This mm -hmm. is uh, uh, Mariel, as you see it nowadays. Uh, this is the bay where you can see most of the boats came in in 1980 during the Mariel boat lift. It's right. amazing to see and to be there that 35 years later we're, we're commemorating that boat lift here in right. South Florida. And, and the Cubans subsequently have built a huge port at Mariel which they hope is going to compete with Port Miami or uh, Port Everglades or Savannah or any other port for the Panamax ships that are going to come through the Panama Canal. So I think I don't know of any American media that's been given access to show what the Port of Mariel is, and you do that among other things. Uh, uh, Michelle, uh, one of the points that we have made is that this is not really a political series of reports. Explain why it's not really, strictly speaking, political. Well, we wanted to show the more human side of Cuba. Uh, we tend to go during times when, uh, during the discussions earlier this year, when the embassy opened, but we wanted to travel outside of Havana and show everyday people how they're living, how they're struggling, or how they're hustling, as we like to say, right. how they're getting by every day. We wanted to show that side. and not necessarily away from politics. We do we do touch upon that, but we also well, wanted to show the more human side. Sure. Well, Hetzel, it is inevitable if you're talking to people who uh, work for the government or other jobs and earn $25 a month, don't really have access to remittances or things like that. I'm sure that they did bring up the politics, the leadership, the society, the economy, uh, all these things. Well, they are all aware of what's happening between the United States and Cuba. And there's one thing I wanted to remind folks. Cubans, when you're in Cuba, they like to always talk about the word resolver, to resolve, yeah. to survive, right? And that's really what they're looking for, more about the financial opportunities that they'll be able to gain as, as, as this process sort of moves forward. Yeah, Michelle, did you find that uh, most Cubans or a lot of Cubans are expectant, hopeful about the new relationship between Cuba and the United States? Pretty much everyone we spoke to is very optimistic. What, they're, what they mostly want is a better economy, right? They want to earn, earn more money. And that's essentially what they're hoping will happen, that the embargo, this will be the window into lifting the embargo, because essentially they believe that the the be all end all is the lifting of the embargo. Right. So you're going to go to Holguin, uh, Santa Clara, uh, Santiago de Cuba, from Pinal de Rio to Guantanamo, from one end to the other. Well, I I just I can't wait to see the pictures and to hear the people of Cuba. And I know you have worked so hard, you and great photographer Bill Damas, uh, who shot it and did Mario Alonso and Mario well. Alonso. I mean. Uh, it's a collective effort of some very talented people. So uh, look forward to it beginning tonight at 11. Thank you for having okay. us. We're honored. Thank you, Michael. All right. Thanks for coming in. All right. Still to come, my personal perspective about moderating political debates. Yeah, I've done a lot. 
and I have some thoughts about how the CNBC crew did the one on Wednesday night. Let's take a live look from our Miami Tower Cam. Looks lovely out there, but for the professional uh, view, let's go to meteorologist Jennifer Correa with your Sunday forecast. Mm -hmm. Jennifer. Good afternoon, Michael. I was about to say good morning, but you know what? It is beautiful out there, whether it's still, you want to call it the morning or the early afternoon. What a nice way to end our weekend here across South Florida. We're having plenty of sunshine. Temperatures are warming up already to those mid 80s. It's actually 86 degrees in Miami, but do know, Pembroke Pines, we're at 88 degrees. So if you're in the inland areas of South Florida, you're definitely going to heat up. You're already feeling it at this hour. Winds are out of the east southeast between 5 to up to 15 miles per hour. Only a couple of showers are pushing through the middle and lower keys. Light to moderate rainfall with these showers. They should be passing towards the northwest and not making much of an impact. We'll continue with the weather, uh, the influence of the weather underneath this high pressure system providing for that east breeze. And this is going to bring us an isolated shower too later on during the week. Jennifer, thanks. All right, before we leave you, a personal perspective about political debates on TV. They have been around for a long time. I certainly remember watching this one in 1960 between Richard Nixon, John F. Kennedy. Truth is, Nixon probably won, except on style points. Kennedy has always looked great. Nixon refused to wear makeup. He thought it wasn't manly, and he sweated profusely. Bottom line, Kennedy was called the winner. The 10 candidates on stage Wednesday night were not sweaty or unkempt. Well, someone should have straightened out Jeb Bush's tie before he went on stage or fixed it during a commercial break. But an askew tie was not Jeb Bush's problem. The problem is he's just not a good debater. Marco Rubio is, and he smoked Bush several times. Ted Cruz showed his skills, and Chris Christie had a few good moments, too. But the moderators hardly had any good moments. They were overall terrible, not well prepared. Uh, Becky Quick, for example, asked Donald Trump a question about something he had said about Facebook founder Mark Zuckerberg. Trump denied ever saying it, and she could not cite the source, even though it was Trump on his own website. John Harwood's first question to Trump was downright insulting. Are you running a comic book campaign for president? Trump said it wasn't a nice question, and he was right. Later, Harwood asked Christie a question in such an unpleasant, hectoring manner that Christie told him he would be considered rude even in New Jersey. I have a bit of sympathy for the CNBC moderators, but none at all for their bosses and producers. They just were not ready for prime time. The candidates were not kept in line. People talked over other people. Questions were often inane, like the first one. Tell me your biggest weakness. <laughs> I'm surprised the next question wasn't, what's your favorite color? Or guys, boxers or briefs? The upshot is that all the media, not just CNBC, took a beating. And the candidates happily piled on. Marco Rubio at one point said, Democrats have the, quote, ultimate super PAC, the mainstream media. Oh, please, that's laughable. You don't have to love the media, don't even have to like us, but please, Understand, we do these debates and political reporting for your benefit. So you get to know the candidates, their positions, qualifications, which one will be the best to keep our great democracy working. If there is any rationale for what we do in the media, that's it. There will be more debates, and hopefully they will be better. That's my perspective for this week. Hope you have a great Sunday. Remember, as always, stay informed, get involved. We will see you next Sunday with Lena. We want to know what you think. I invite you to weigh in on any topic you like. Email, Facebook, Twitter, any of these addresses. We're easy to find, and we do respond. We'll see you next Sunday. Okay.